you guys. You can use those mics if you want. We'll uh, begin starting in just a couple of minutes here. Everyone find your seats, please. Hi, Tigger. <laughs> All right, everyone, welcome back for lunch. If you were at that uh, plush nightclub event last night, uh, good morning. That was a pretty good event, so thanks to Cyrus One, Netflix, and Brocade. Uh, this morning, or this afternoon, haha, <laughs> caught me. Uh, we're going to do a panel that uh, Elisa Yasinska, I practiced that name, has put together for us on traffic accounting. Elisa? Thank you. All right, welcome back after lunch. I hope no one has fallen asleep. Um, this is the traffic accounting panel, and I'm Lisa Yasinska, and let me start out with introducing our panelists of the day. In the, in the spirit of traffic accounting, we have assembled everyone, get up guys, we have assembled everyone in an up and to the right formation, just so it looks a little bit like a <laughs> graph up in front. Works well, right? <laughs> so we have Paolo Lucenta up here on the bottom side. <laughs> he works for Carradon Technologies and he's the author of the open source flow accounting software PMA CCT. We have Brand Van Dusen, he is with Limelight Networks, and he's been heavily involved in Limelight's traffic accounting software setup. He will tell you all about it later. Then we have Arjen Fine, who is a head of engineering now at Amzix, I believe. And he's been working a lot on different tools that Amzix has in place for traffic, traffic cor correlation and all kinds of performance metrics. And then we have Aaron, who's going to be the first one up here in a minute, giving us an introduction into the subject. Um, slides. Oh, here we go. Okay, perfect. So let's start out with just a little bit of background, and then I'm going to pass this on to Aaron here. Um, what we all need, we all need some form of insight and visibility into our traffic, into our networks, to be able to plan, to forecast, to troubleshoot. We need, we need data for that. We need intelligence. Once we have that data collected out of various software solutions that are out there, we will be getting into that. Um, we need to correlate and we need to present that data somehow. And all of this 
are different pieces of the puzzle and all of them require a lot of engineering, assembling of, of different parts. And it's all a big effort so far in various networks to, to, put the, to put the presentation together that you in the end need to be able to look at your network and say, I have a problem here, I have a problem there, this is how I need to plan, this is how I need to build out, this is how I need to forecast. There, oh, slides here. So there are various tools out there, open source and not open source that people use. Um, maybe let's do a real quick show of hands. Who is using SNMP tools, MRTG, etc., in their network? Get data. That's quite a bit, okay. Who is using any kind of flow data collection in their networks? That's quite a bit as well, okay, but less than the SNMP side. All right. Um, especially the the especially the flow side of things is is not as easy to grasp as um, the, the SNMP one. So many correlations need to happen. You would like to know. You would you would like to see AS path prefixes. You would like to know which AS am I pushing traffic to where. All of that requires to correlate with BGP with. IGP and all kinds of data around your network. So all of the tools, unless you're using an off-the-shelf appliance, need tool smithing and work to... <laughs> Please silence cell phones. <laughs> yeah, I should turn off my phone. Um, all right, so the problems that we're facing is that we need a lot of work on sysadmin side, on database side, on collection, on the software that is out there to put all of it together out of different pieces and build something out of that. Um, especially Ariane and Brand are going to talk about the different solutions that AMSIX and Limelight Networks have in place and put up um, to collect data. And let's start out with a little bit of an introduction into the subject by Aaron. All yours. Uh, good after lunch food coma. Uh, so this is just talking a bit about, about traditional tools that we've used for uh, accounting data. Um, hopefully these are more historical than current, but uh, to lay the groundwork, um, the majority of us use for uh, you know either traditional SNMP, something like 95th percentiles, um, have had some challenges over the recent years in uh, interface growth, moving from things like 32-bit counters to 64-bit counters, having some rollover problems in the meantime, and challenges converting old graphs to new graphs. Uh, it's not really the greatest solution for billing, but we tend to use it all over the place regardless, uh, which is always surprising. It's good for a snapshot and will hold a fairly accurate month of data, uh, and I think we've you know, all settled on um, 95th for very good reasons related to SNMP. And certainly the storage in RRD style uh, collection for SNMP is uh, really challenging to go back in history and find accurate data uh, due to averaging over time, and of course that, that data volume going down. You know, certainly I'm, I'm sure all of you have had calls from a customer going, I'm disputing a bill that's a year old or a six month year or six month old, and uh, pulling up old data really just doesn't work. We end up doing ridiculous things like taking screen captures every month. Uh, and also differentiating internal and external traffic is also is, is challenging. You know, if you have customers, for example, that have multiple interfaces and VLANs and might do things like database synchronization between their own ports, you're still counting all of that data, and they're being billed for it crossing, uh, you know, their their VLAN rather than the external edges. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know it's a good tool. We've been using it for a lot of years, but uh, it's certainly got its challenges. Of course, there's something like traditional DPI, and um, you know the word traditional here is 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 broad. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do deep packet inspection, mirroring, copying of ports, um, but not many many things that can track to tap 
uh, ports very well. You know, there's, there's a bunch of cards out there, for example, that'll tap traffic, like in Days Cards. It'll give you that line rate copy of traffic, but doesn't do a lot with processing in the, uh, on line rate. And certainly, if you're doing this kind of traffic analysis to capture things, you're actually tripling your, tra your uh, traffic volume because you get the whole pipe plus a copy of the transmit and a copy of the receive. And of course, as those go to some kind of central location for doing any kind of analysis, that you know that triple volume becomes more and more as they pass your aggregate link. So you're just sending huge amounts of traffic off into central locations, which means you end up spreading them out all over the place uh, for this triple volume to do these local analytics and then passing the analytic result back to some other place. And of course, we have some pretty serious I.O. limitations, right? You can't really write this fast to disk or databases. If you really want to get true analytics for tap ports, they just don't work all that well today. And even if you were to successfully get all of this data, processing is a real pain, right? The analytics actually take so long that you're not getting them live, so you end up having to do this and summarize data and roll it over, and you know, if something crashes or you miss it, you have to recover from it. Again, a real pain. Uh, and of course, if you really are truly doing you know, some kind of tapping and processing and analytics, you expose yourself some, to some privacy issues uh, where you're only allowed to do very specific things with these traffic. And as a carrier, people don't like uh, the idea of tapping ports. There's also, of course, traditional flow. Uh, it has its problems, right? You've got multiple versions to deal with. And the biggest one, of course, is that vendors treat flow differently on different versions of uh, router software. And, uh, and it's a real pain to continually update which interfaces are considered egress and ingress for tagging for flow data. Um, and sampling is always a big challenge, right? Your sample rates, you're looking for accuracy, but at the same time, you don't want to give up your processing power of your router. And if you're getting really high sampling rates, uh, you could end up really killing a router from things like a DDoS attack where it amplifies it, getting all that, uh, that, that switch traffic into flow as well. So these are just some samples of sort of some traditional versions of, of collection. And of course, there's all kinds of traditional visualization tools that go with it, things like our RD tool, Cacti, MRTG, all kinds of homegrown tools, PNG, JPEG libraries, whatever you've done, um, very simple examples of traditional visualization. But we're going to talk about emerging trends. So I'm going to pass it to Paolo to uh, start off with the first example. So uh, this is Paolo. <laughs> So um, I bring here essentially two slides, and uh, traditional and emerging, uh, just to make a point that uh, traffic accounting as is not a new discipline at all. It's uh, in a sense it's not rocket, rocket science, but uh, you know times are evolving, and uh, traffic uh, accounting is something that is evolving as well with time. So it's uh, there are new needs that are coming, uh, you know, uh, from the market, or um, and uh, the traffic accounting is. Uh, is or should be following with those needs. So um, uh, among the traditional trends of what uh, uh, traffic accounting has been used for uh, in the years, it's a uh, number of items that you see uh, on this slide. So uh, one interesting thing is uh, how many times I face to people that still uh, think that traffic accounting equates one-to-one -one with security. Uh, well, security is, of course, uh, always a uh, an evergreen topic, uh, let's say, uh, but uh, it's uh, definitely not the only topic that you can address with traffic accounting. So uh, as of myself, I've been uh, specializing or doing a lot of work uh, in the past and also currently on the last two items of this slide. So capacity planning, traffic engineering, and especially uh, analyzing uh, internet peering and transit uh, by using uh, traffic accounting and specifically flow data. Um, get into the emerging needs, uh, let's say, um, I see uh, this, this slide doesn't want to be comprehensive and also the one on the traditional trends doesn't want to be comprehensive. But let's say I work with a uh, number of uh, service providers, uh, let's say, and um, uh, this is the most popular things that seem to pop up uh, over time. So uh, the first is uh, really a segue uh, from uh, the previous uh, slide. So traditionally we uh, have been, uh, so if 
you see in, on the previous slide, there is analyzing internet peering and, and, uh, and transit, so just looking at the uh, uh, traffic ratios and uh, amount of traffic exchanged. And uh, I mean, the most exciting thing that traditional has been doing in that area was, uh, you know, 95 percentile. And you, if you really wanted to get even more excited, aggregated calculations. So you make a single volume of a number of interfaces that you are, for example, peering with another party and you do a 95 percentile out of that. Uh, but now things are changing, right? So it's uh, getting even the peering and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, connecting uh, IP transit customers. It's getting a lot into uh, dollar in, dollar out. So business intelligence. Really, people want to have a much better view of where this traffic is coming from and getting to. So I see, um, I, div I divided this uh, area that I see uh, very popular in three subcategories. So like uh, customer profitability. So it's like... Um, it can be seen under a number of lights. And so let's say, let's take the typical IP transit customer, so wholesale customer. Um, I see a rising interest into uh, seeing, okay, this guy is paying me now uh, half a dollar per mag, let's say. Am I making a profit on that? So let's try to see whether how much of my transit or how much of my peering this customer is uh, uh, you know, consuming, so how much I'm paying for this, and also how much of the backbone, how much I'm traveling this uh, this, the traffic for this customer. And then uh, there is uh, the OTT, uh, uh, so over the top caches behavior, right? So uh, there is uh, a lot of placing uh, caches from the OTT in uh, the backbone. And uh, somebody does it uh, genuinely because of the quality of service. And some others just smell a deal. So I get some traffic for free, let's say, or not taking uh, a lot of uh, resources. And then I can uh, make a profit out of it and things like that. But uh, let's say what can happen is that uh, at some stage, the, yeah, uh, the, the deal is not a deal anymore because, of course, the OTT can also approach the downstream customers and things like that, which is necess not necessarily uh, an issue, uh, but at least the people I see, they really like to be aware about uh, what's going on. And then the third thing is uh, peering traffic distance or uh, bit miles calculations. So what I see is uh, um, an emerging trend uh, that uh, is going uh, most likely under the hood because I didn't see much presentations yet uh, about it in, you know, uh, at conferences or peering forum and things like that. About the fact that uh, you know, ratios uh, are mattering a little bit less or, uh, but uh, there is much more uh, an interest into uh, the volume of traffic is changed, but also how deep this traffic is being traveled into my backbone. So how much of the, you know, how much I'm paying in terms of backbone to deliver the traffic from, for example, a content provider and things like that. And then we have a second area, which is uh, uh, SDN, um, which is, uh, of course, uh, traffic accounting is not uh, definitely the only, uh, you know, uh, element of the equation, but it's an essential element of the equation, uh, by which, uh, by having uh, traffic statistics, uh, then uh, coupling with uh, much other information from uh, the network, then you can get really, um, you know, a picture, enough information to do some educated uh, routing uh, decisions. So once again, capa uh, yeah, capacity planning, traffic engineering, it comes back once again. And finally, I see uh, more and more, uh, uh, you know, uh, mobile operators coming also, uh, you, know, um, you know, speaking about the traffic accounting, IP traffic accounting flows and things like that, which is something that I couldn't recognize, uh, you know, in the past. Of course, this is because uh, their infrastructures are getting more and more into the IP uh, space. Uh, so they are more and more con uh, connected through IP elements. But, and this is a very nice uh, that uh, Elisa uh, was saying before about the correlation. This is a very good example of correlation because uh, the people in the mobile uh, space, they do not really uh, speak about uh, MAC addresses or about uh, IP addresses and things like that. They speak about context, they speak about mobile phone numbers and things like that. So it's a very nice uh, uh, example of uh, really uh, a whole world which uh, uh, um, uh, it's really 
you know, uh, it's the data part. Uh, it's very tightly controlled by the control plane. Uh, so by establishing associations with uh, you, with the devices and things like that, and you should keeping uh, constantly the two uh, kind of information uh, uh, hand in hand and uh, updated because otherwise, uh, you know, you get something uh, useless out of it. So that's uh, another, uh, you know, uh, thing which is emerging for traffic accounting. So doing uh, a lot of uh, GTP inspection and things like that. So wanted to share with you, so what are, mm, my opinion, or from my viewpoint, the current and emerging trends, and I leave it uh, to the uh, people that do the real stuff. So Brent. Thanks, Paolo. <clears throat> so I'm really excited to tell you guys all about what we've been doing at Limelight with accounting, especially with uh, Paolo's uh, open source PM account software. So PM account is uh, basically an open source C uh, program that can accept any kind of uh, NetFlow, SFlow, IP fix. It even has probes that you can install to be able to uh, you know, set up a tap kind of a situation and be able to input those flows into PM account and then configure PM account to basically take a look at that uh, multi-dimensional data that's coming in and aggregate and uh, basically collect this information in multiple different ways. So there's all kinds of data coming in with the flows, but there's all kinds of views that you want to have that's specific to those flows and PM account is, is what we've been uh, using over the past couple of years to, uh, to, to pull this information out. The thing that became, or I guess when PM account became viable for us, it was uh, when Paolo was able to incorporate BGP data into the flow data to be able to extract the vital information that we needed to be able to do traffic engineering on the network, which is I need to know prefix lengths and I need to know AS paths. And that kind of stuff um, was only available at the time with, uh, with a BGP implementation that Paolo was able to put into the software. And from that, uh, uh, the evolution from there was that eventually we were able to not have to use the BGP uh, feed from each router and we were able to get that information directly out of the flow information with the extended um, data sets that are available. So the other thing that was really neat was a PM account has a very extensible plugin um, backend architecture to allow us to store this data in a, uh, in a backend database, which allows and facilitates for, you know, some interesting, uh, uh, so, you know, basically queries that we could do on data that, that were very uh, exacting and we could go in and just slice out exactly what we needed to look at based on the router, the if index on the interface that we're looking at or, you know, from the network as a whole. And again, um, in all different dimensions of data, both temporal dimensions uh, by five minutes, by, by days, by weeks, by years, by months, and also uh, just by the different uh, types of data in there. So we wouldn't be able to instantly store all information from every flow sample that came in in one place because the whole cardinality with the potential numbers of permutations of aggregations that would happen would be completely blowing up any kind of system that we were able to put together and, and actually store that. So. Uh, here's some basic collector architecture overview of what we were able to put together with uh, the software that Paolo has, writ has written. The, the neat thing that we have here is that uh, we can replicate an S-flow or uh, any kind of flow information really to multiple different uh, sockets on the same server. And we do this for a few reasons. One is just, uh, well, we do this for three different things basically. So. We take an incoming flow and there's a PM account process that runs and listens to that flow, or that listens to the incoming flows from the routers directly. Then it replicates that flow out to three other PM account processes that are also running on the same server. So we've got one basically that's listening um, with snort. So we're doing a little bit of intrusion detection um, on, you know, from the flow data that's coming in. So if there's a SYN floods or UDP floods or that kind of thing, we can go ahead and set snort alarms on each of our uh, collectors that are able to alert us for any kind of uh, security type things. 
the next thing we pipe um, the SFlow to is another uh, SFlow tool process that's just sitting there. SFlow tool, I don't know if you're familiar, has a, uh, a command switch to basically be able to dump the raw headers that are coming in in the flow samples as TCP dump format packets. And then I'm able to write those to disk on at periodic intervals and uh, save that information so that I can go back and look uh, for like a forensic kind of a thing later on and, and be able to just use TCP dump, a common tool to be able to look at any kind of um, information that's in that uh, sampled header that's in the flow sample. So I think there's only uh, two or 300 bytes of uh, header information that you can get in each packet sample, but that's enough to get the basic information that al allows us to kind of secure our network. And then the last thing is, is the main flow aggregation, the PM account uh, recon box there. And that's using uh, MySQL as a backend storage mechanism. So each of the collectors that we build has a, a MySQL memory storage table. We ended up using memory storage because of the amount of flow information that was coming in on, a, on a, any given collector and just the commodity hardware that uh, we had at the time to be able to throw at this project didn't really have the disk I.O. capabilities to be able to take all that raw aggregated data and save it uh, without the server falling on its face. So we ended up just uh, specking servers that didn't necessarily have a lot of disk I.O. speed, but that did have a decent amount of um, onboard memory. So I think we're doing uh, 12 or 16 gigabytes in each of the collectors right now. Um, and then basically the disk storage is just for saving those TCP dump flows. So all that TCP dump data um, from one of the plugins is going straight to disk and we can go back and uh, if Snort alerts us for some kind of attack, we can go and look at that TCP dump data for the time period that Snort alerted us and be able to determine you know, what the nature of the attack was, if there's any kind of signature that we could identify, is there any way that we could maybe take that information and um, use that to build filters on our network, et cetera. So the multiple collector architecture is kind of like this. We've got all the routers uh, you know, individually send to one collector or another. And we have a pool of collectors that all essentially have a, a script that runs and looks for certain interfaces. Now, part of the problem is um, we have SFlow enabled on all of our interfaces on the entire network. And it's just a, due to a, a way that SFlow works. The in, input interface basically is the one that uh, looks at the packet sample. And we were mostly interested in looking at our egress since we're CDN and we just push bits out to the, to the world all day. So. That was the, the main um, direction that we wanted to focus on. So what we have is kind of a mapping um, uh, script that looks at the data and the collectors and then just pulls out information based on uh, router ID and uh, if index that just says, hey, these are interfaces that I'm interested in based on the port label on the interface. So that all basically dumps back into a single large um, MySQL backend database. And then from there, we're able to uh, write custom uh, scripts on cacti to look, you know, not a script necessarily, but just a command to go and pull data out of the database for a single point of data and populate an RRD file for certain things. I'll show you those in a second. Uh, we have another tool that we're, uh, that we've developed internally called Recon. It's a command line interface that allows us to be able to look at this type of stuff. Um, you know, previously we were using an appliance and it's all GUI based and it takes a long time to navigate through with mouse and click and router and interface and find all that stuff. So it was really handy to be able to have a CLI tool or that was the, uh, I guess the goal at the beginning was to have a CLI tool to be able to say, hey, I'm on this router, I'm, I'm affecting changes right now, I'm like, I got this other window, I can just run a command and tell me exactly what uh, each interface on each router is doing as far as prefixes or ASPAS or whatever, whatever. So yeah, here's the neat data. Uh, IPv6 information, there's no real other way to get IPv6 traffic levels without looking at flow information. So uh, that's a really cool uh, side effect of um, having a flow analysis tool set now. Uh, our backbone interfaces, typically uh, we're sending traffic from cache nodes or origin nodes to cache nodes. It's all internal traffic. It's not your typical carrier traffic where we're dealing with a lot of customer traffic that's basically not at our control. Um, but there were certain instances where we were egressing traffic out of a uh, city that was not the city that was generating that traffic. And there's really no way to, um, to kind of break down what the traffic was on our network other than it was full. 
So this uh, has given us the kind of ability to visualize that in, in a neat, different way. Uh, another thing is uh, visualizing tra traffic that was going to a provider. Maybe we did some TE and didn't, we didn't have capacity over a, a peering link, and so we'd have to move traffic to transit. It really gave us the opportunity or ability to look in the database and do an easy query that would say, show me all traffic that is going to the XYZ ASN, but where that ASN is not the first hop in the AS, AS path, which is indicating to us that that traffic is going over some other suboptimal um, costly link. Um, and then, yeah, so command line utilities being able to do that stuff, and I talked about the snort and the TCP dump uh, information already. So here is an example of some SNMP data at the top of, a, of one of our backbone interfaces, and then a breakdown of what the traffic looks like when it's grouped into four different general uh, categories that we were able to come up with. So the, the, the green at the bottom is basically the, that internal traffic where the source and the destination IP address or prefix are prefixes that are in our IGP. And so we use that information to make the assumption that that's all traffic coming from um, our servers or systems and going to other servers and systems on our network. But then we were able to kind of break that down even further and say, okay, well, what about traffic that's coming from Limelight managed uh, devices but going to non-Limelight managed devices? And so that's the next line. And then the opposite inverse of that is traffic that's coming from uh, non-Limelight devices and going to Limelight um, managed devices or, or networks. And then the last thing is just traffic that is not from Limelight or to Limelight, and it's you know typically customer traffic that uh, you know it's a customer just going to the internet, and basically we'd be able to see that. So before PM account and and this whole system that we were able to develop, we would just see the the graph on the top. It looks like it's maybe full, but what what are we what are we able to find there? Well, in the bottom graph, you can see all that yellow traffic is traffic that's going from. Uh, limelight networks to somewhere off the network and I don't I don't necessarily want to see it on that link there so I'd be able to go in and, and do a, a recon command on this backbone interface and be able to see the exact prefixes and the exact AS paths that um, we needed to move or try and change so that's one uh, neat data point that we've got now uh, the next thing is just v6 data this data was unavailable to us prior to being able to implement PM account and um, have the uh, specific filtering as far as uh, flows that come in and saying, okay, drop all flow data that's v4, only save flow data that's v6, save that in a database table, dump that into the main database. And then we have just some homegrown uh, graphing software to kind of pull that out. You can see right here in June where IPv6 day kicked in and there's the first inflection point. Go IPv6. And then uh, August or so is when we started actually ramping customers, existing customers, and enabling V6 for those guys, and ramping those guys into, um, into the V6 land. So V6 is awesome. And here's Recon. This is just a basic uh, uh, command line utility that we've developed that allows us to look at any number of data points. So we can say Recon. Uh, dash L's for location. We can either provide a pop name, uh, we can provide a specific interface, uh, we could provide a, a specific router name. We can look for prefixes, we can look for AS paths, we can look for destination AS, we can look for source and destination networks on different interfaces depending on if it's a backbone interface um, between two cities or if it's an egress interface that's going out to the network. And uh, yeah, the future. So. Right now we're using MySQL as the back end and it's kind of limited as far as uh, scalability goes. It's a lot of times a, a single user is gonna make a request and they might be querying a ton of data and that is gonna be locked to like a single CPU and however many s disks are behind that server. So um, part of the direction that we're trying to go right now is with uh, the NoSQL solution, being able to parallelize all of those uh, inserts and selects to be able to improve the performance of everything and eventually have the, um, I guess, SLA on our own internal tool that would allow us to kind of start pulling that information into some traffic automation platforms and that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you.
went. Um, we at M6, uh, we have it easy. Um, we do not do anything, basically, uh, in terms of pricing based on traffic. So um, all our traffic accounting is um, more or less um, accurate, but we are not really um, concerned if it's really, really accurate because of we don't price on accounting. We price on, on, uh, on a fixed price per port per month. Why do we do a traffic accounting? Well, mostly for our services, for, for our members. They just want to see how much traffic they do on the internet exchange, and, and we would like to see that too. And we would like to show a big graph on, uh, on the front page of our web page and to show how awesome we are and how much traffic we uh, exchange. And we, we want to, uh, to show graphs on how much IPv6 traffic is going over the internet exchange. We also use it to, uh, to predict what we think the future will be. Um, we use it to extrapolate the, the growth and see like when do we need to upgrade our switches, when do we need to uh, upgrade our backbones, and we use it for troubleshooting. So what do we have? Um, well, we have uh, SNMP counters, and we count uh, bits, frames, and errors, the, the interface counters that every interface has, and we put it all down in RID tool, and um, we use uh, an, an, an adapted version of MRTG for that. Um, we have a web portal where our customers can uh, can log into and they can see their own graphs. Uh, what I particularly like about it is that we have an optional uh, option to um, show graphs with a logarithmic y-axis, which is particularly handy for errors, and that's why I put this graph on, where you see like a, a big peak uh, in the middle and you see a very, very small peak on uh, for you the right-hand side. Um, and that's only visible because you can put it in a uh, in a, on a logarithmic y scale. Um, um, the public graph, the public graph that shows that we do al al almost two terabits per second on, uh, on peak times is an aggregate of all these counters from all these customers together. Next to that, um, we have S-Flow, which is based on uh, a pull module, and that's S-Flow, which Elisa made. Um, and we basically, when the S-Flow uh, datagrams come in, uh, come in, we almost throw all the data away that, uh, that's in there. We only uh, store uh, and look at the uh, source and destination MAC addresses and the ether type. That's the only thing that is of interest for us. All the other the data, um, the whole uh, samples uh, that are in the datagrams are not of interest for us because we don't think it's our traffic. We are an Ethernet club in the end. We switch Ethernet frames. That's what we do. And so we look only at the Ethernet, uh, um, Ethernet property of things. Um, and again, this is all put down into our detail. And we have a web portal that is uh, available for our customers where they can see the traffic per peer. How do we do that? Uh, we collect the, uh, the datagrams we, that is collected on the ingress interface of the switch, and then we'll figure it out like, hey, that is, has destination MAC address uh, of that peer, so we'll put it as output traffic on, uh, on the portal for that peer. So there is a whole lot of mi uh, mixing and matching uh, uh, behind that to make all these graphs. And then we present it in a way, uh, usually where we say a top 10 of the most uh, uh, the peers that you do most volume with. And with that, our customers can actually do some uh, traffic engineering and make peering decisions on it and see if they can uh, do a lot of traffic with a certain peer and want to move it to private interconnects or they suddenly see that there's uh, a peer they don't peer at all with and they send a lot of traffic to them. Where does that, that come from? Oh, yeah, we do something with the route server too. That, um, that is all visible with this portal and it's a very, very useful tool. Um, next to that, we do something else um, that is more active monitoring, a little bit what the previous panel was talking about. Um, we s actively send uh, frames with timing information around on a platform where we d uh, measure delay, uh, jitter, and, uh, and frame loss with, um, and we call this the, the, the key performance identifiers. Um, 
this is an active system, uh, actively sending frames around on our platform. Um, uh, the funny thing is this is not presented in, uh, in RD2 and not stored in RD2. We um, uh, use uh, something made by a company, Sinleaf, and they have this nice uh, HTML5 or flash graphs that change every five seconds. So it's, you can see uh, this all real time. It's really cool to see. Um, for our own troubleshooting uh, or our own um, uh, network um, Ma management, we also have some scripts that basically send us emails. <laughs> send emails about, hey, this particular port shows error. So it, a script that peri periodically goes through all these RD files and checks like, hey, there's an error here and there's an error in this port and reports this all in a daily email. Uh, and it also sh uh, uh, shows like almost overutilized links. So we can go to our customers or our members and say like, hey, um, you know that your port is full, you might want to think of an upgrade, or you might want to, to think of looking at the s -load tool that we just uh, saw to see, like, hey, perhaps you can do some traffic engineering to get some traffic away, because yeah, you heard your, your port is full. So um, we also have for ourselves uh, a sort of correlation tool, which takes the, um, the, uh, uh, the historical data, basically the, the, the data from from the day before and compares it with a certain time period you select. And with that, we can uh, try to find some anom anomalies. And uh, if you look at the traffic graph from, uh, from yesterday, there is like a, a weird up uptake in, um, in, in the traffic. And with this tool, I can find, and you have to believe me, the graph below is from a customer port that just sent suddenly much more traffic to our platform. Um, what are the issues we have? Well, uh, we don't have a neat database like Limelight has. Uh, for us, it's a huge number of RID files. It's really huge. Um, so basically, we have a file system database. And we have all kinds of scripts that plow through all these RID files, open them, extract the data out of them, close them, take the next file, go on and on and on. This digging through all these files makes the system really, really slow. Um, and also, we, we have to have a pretty fast file system, uh, fast system needed to update all these five, all these files every five seconds. This is um, this is slow and, in the end, not really scalable. So, what what would you like? And this is what I think what you would like. Um, perhaps this SNMP polling mechanism is not scalable in the end. We have to see what we can do with slow counters, slow data grams also contain counter information. It's the same data as, as you pull out with F SNMP, um, but it's being pushed towards, towards the, the collection systems, and you can parallelize that much better. Um, I think that there must be something like an, uh, a multidimensional RD-like system. Um, right now, there, we, we correlate lots and lots of RD files, and it would be much nicer if you can have some kind of data structure of database type thing where you can make these correlations and do fast queries in it as, as this is if it's one database. It must be scalable because um, in the end I don't think that will, and I think Limelight already does that, uh, you do it on one system, you need to have multiple systems. So um, some kind of multi-host system is, uh, is probably the, the future. So. That is what, what I think, and I guess we can have a discussion now. All right. Thank you, guys. That was very informative. So let me summarize up a little bit what we've talked about. Um, as Paolo mentioned, none of this is rocket science, but we still seem to be behind on the possibilities that that we have. and. The, the possibility of correlation of various inputs, various data models that we get out of parts of our network um, seems to be something very interesting that should be followed up on and get more in depth on that. And the repeated mention, and this is something I, I just realized actually that every single one of you was talking about the back end and the scalability of the back end and the issues that we have. Um, with that, so how are we gonna, and let's just move into
questions out of that. So one thing that I would like to talk about is how do you guys see the database backend situation behind something like flow collection or other metrics? How is that going to evolve and how are we going to make it more scalable than the current solutions that are used? I know that Paolo has been playing a little bit and in investigating different database models. Dig right into it. Tell us all about it. Yeah, so uh, I've been um, experimenting, uh, I, I, let's say, uh, recently with uh, NoSQL databases. And uh, at the moment, I've, um, uh, I've done kind of a selection because uh, the NoSQL world, uh, it seems to be an endless world, right? So there is a lot of things. It's uh, clearly where you see that uh, there is a lack of uh, standardization. So. You can say a lot of things against the relational databases, but then you have a standardized way to uh, put the data into the database and get it out. And that's uh, something, uh, some sort of standardized interface, the uh, NoSQL or the NoSQL, um, or uh, I would say 99% of them, uh, it's, not, uh, it's, uh, it's lacking at the moment. So it has been a little bit a painful process. And I ended up uh, experimenting a bit with uh, MongoDB uh, myself, uh, where I got, uh, in some cases, uh, comparable results to SQL, and in other cases, um, and outperforming. And one of the things that I did, like, I mean, uh, traffic accounting, I mean, uh, or uh, traffic accounting out of flow data, it's uh, a lot about aggregation. So one thing uh, that I did really like of recent MongoDB is that uh, the, the, the a native uh, sort of implementation, uh, if you can say a native implementation of MapReduce, or actually you can get rid of Map reduce in favor of a native uh, way of aggregating data and uh, which is pretty interesting for a NoSQL solution so that's why I thought it was very interesting and fitting the problem statement let's say all right thanks um, I believe we mentioned Cassandra before as well Yeah, so Cassandra is just another uh, NoSQL database. I think Facebook uses it for most of their stuff, and we've looked at uh, using it internally in other groups, but that um, other group and networking haven't really got together yet as much as we could to develop that any further. So um, the thing about Cassandra is that it's all Java-based, and a lot of the stuff that Paolo's doing is all based in C, and, and what Paolo's saying about the optimizations of the map reduce uh, functionality I guess that we would need on top of really yeah it is the <laughs> and the non-standardization of all these different NoSQL products is, is really confusing so so we could have a Cassandra database that would be able to store and retrieve information but then if we wanted to do analytics on data in there you know we'd have to do something like with a, like a Hadoop cluster and be able to write those map reduce jobs that he's talking about and that's the part that has that abstracted Java-based kind of thing, and it, it adds a little bit of computational um, stuff to the top of it. So uh, at this point, I'm, um, I'm really happy with what Palo's put together with the MongoDB and um, the streamlinedness of it. I, I like that, so. All right, and last question on databases for Aryan. So are you guys planning on moving away from the RD files, flat files on the servers you guys have into something more database-like? You mentioned it, but any investigations on that? Yeah, but uh, at the moment it's more talking like we should do this. Um, this is not going to scale um, in the future. Um, but uh, there are more important things to do uh, for us right now. <laughs> but uh, we are aware of the problem, and I guess um, we'll be uh, ready just in time with something new. So no, uh, we'll <laughs> right, uh, yeah. become a concern. <laughs> okay, um, so something else, correlation. And I'm gonna start with Paolo again. So, so Paolo, <laughs> you built in the functionality into PMA CCT to correlate data with IGP, BGP, and get all kinds of additional information out of 
not just the flow samples. What else do you see that could be correlated into a system like that and useful to have in your flow information in the future? Yeah, um, let's say um, uh, I can definitely see that, uh, you know, uh, the BGP, IGP, uh, it's something of uh, very much use for service. Oh, that has been very useful, uh, yeah. For service providers. And I think that uh, the correlation, uh, I, I think you made, uh, I stress once again, a very important point is with correlate, uh, correlating multiple informations together, right? So um, at some stage, I, I guess that uh, uh, moving into different, let's say, segments, so from the service provider, so carrier, uh, IP transit, and things like that, there is a lot that can be done uh, when you get closer, let's say, to the end users, for example. So I was doing one example with uh, mobile providers that are getting IP, so of course, correlation of uh, uh, flow data or traffic data against uh, GTP, for example. And uh, another, of course, uh, the, uh, would be the equivalent for the residential business edge, I would say, would be uh, correlation against DHCP or against uh, radius or wherever you you know, the IP address or the MAC address doesn't mean anything anymore. So you have other ways or other means to identify a user and uh, identify user, you know, you know, what the user is doing. So definitely that's, uh, those are the areas that I see, uh, I mean, uh, very, I mean, that I see coming. Uh, how about, I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming away here, but how about like what Ariane was talking about with the system they have set up for, for jitter and delay? And course, to have that course, somewhat, somehow course. encapsulated in your flow data across your backbone or something like that? Yeah, of course, of course, of course. That's, uh, that, that, that is something, definitely something um, very interesting. And uh, one other thing could be another area, let's say, that is worth some uh, investigation, I would say, is uh, also the how to correlate DPI data with flow data. So I, with the flow data, you get the big picture, of course, but then from uh, DPI or f from some shots of DPI, you can see, you know, uh, at the edge, uh, what the customer is doing, customer behavior and things like that. I don't know, there is uh, some works going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that's, uh, of course, the scalability, it's a big issue over there. So that's the part. There we are at databases yes. again, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Aaron was nodding over there. Correlate something. Generally, when I look at uh, the long-term correlation, you know, it's really, you know, when we start to look at the concept of data center as a unit or power to packet and, um, you know, taking events like humidity, temperature, uh, power utilization, processor utilization, moving around virtual machines, et cetera, and actually calculating things like the cost of a total set of units being distributed to one area or another uh, on, on, uh, on related to whatever metrics the customers are paying for. So I, I think you know correlation is absolutely essential, uh, and unfortunately, we, we we still haven't even scratched the surface of tools to really do large scale analytics and uh, and and come up with real answers to big picture questions like cost. All right. Okay, we still have a couple of minutes to go. How about some questions from out there? I think we can open up the mics if anyone wants to step up. Go right ahead. Um, this is Aid LinkedIn. Um, how um, have you guys looked at grid computing like Hadoop, and does that work? Uh, I mean, for scalability stuff like like analytics, large scale analytics. I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, so Hadoop we're using internally for uh, uh, log file processing from the edge servers that are delivering objects. So to touch on the point that Elisa was just making earlier, the holy grail for us is basically being able to bridge the gap between the network and the application level logs to be able to correlate that information with the, you know, so if I have an object that's delivered I know the exact time that that object was delivered, how big it was, and what the destination host was, and then um, you know be able to track that back to basically what interface and router port and how much that 
you know, traffic ended up costing, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> the eventual goal is to be able to use that Hadoop um, kind of infrastructure to, to expand into the network uh, data and use that to augment the data that we're currently processing with, um, with the applications. I, I guess my question is a little bit more like, um, how is it working out? I mean, is it, is it something that, that in scale you think <coughs> it's, it's good? I'm kind of doing a little bit of that myself and, and seeing, like, would love to see other people do it and, and get some feedback on how it's going, is it the right direction or not? Okay, yeah, the biggest challenge is just the development cycle for it. But yeah, we're absolutely seeing um, improvements in performance and gains that, uh, you know, 10 times more performance than we would have seen trying to individually process these things um, without some kind of a larger uh, Hadoop MapReduce type cluster. Absolutely. Thanks. Actually, to the point of the question, I have done a, a fair bit of playing to try to deal a, with A quick mic. request. Can people really learn how to use the mic? Because it's impossible to hear most of what's being said. And maybe I'm the only one here, but, you know, are every, is everyone able to hear stuff? Because I'm not able now? to hear a lot of what's being said. You have to speak closer to the mic and, and especially the speakers. You have to be really conscious because when you're sitting there, you can't tell whether your voice is coming here. But if you speak into the mic and you speak loudly, it can be heard. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Um, we, I'm involved in a project that's been looking at really large scale flow and to Palo's point, or, or I've, we've looked at not all, but a number of the NoSQL databases, some of whom, Cassandra, you sort of read the documentation and blood starts pouring out of your ears as you try to figure out what the data model is. Um, and a lot of it that, that other people have been able to get really high insert rates for, we just couldn't uh, deploying in cluster. Uh, the problem with Hadoop, as a friend of mine likes to say, is it's stupidity, but it's stupidity that scales. Um, it is true that you can solve problems eventually by putting enough nodes on and touching every byte of data on the file system that's got a couple problems. One of them is the Java that you mentioned, and for that I would recommend MapR, which is a Hadoop distribution that's, that's written using C++ underneath. We put it on a few of our clusters, and the network was the bottleneck with 48 disks per, and it was saturating the 10 gig doing, and we were all clapping in the corner, like finally something that actually scales. Um, the problem on top of that is then the, your option for not writing Java, not touching every file on disk, and, and being away from MapReduce is Hive or Pig, which then compile to Java and submit as MapReduce and are pretty inefficient. So the approach that uh, this project was taking was to write something sort of like Hive, a structured query language, but then that skips all of the rest of Hadoop and runs on top of the clustered file system, you know, that is HDFS or, or MapR. And I, I think you need something like that, because I do not think that uh, for dealing with a 10 gig that could be doing a gigabyte per minute of, of flow ingest if you're doing, let's say, in front of that data center or something that you really want to do unsampled and get performance for, I think a lot of the NoSQL have a problem, and then the trick is, how do you write the efficient layer that only touches the data you need? If you're doing a graph for the last three days, right, you don't want a MapReduce process that's going to go and touch every byte on the disk. And so um, that's the approach that I think, I think it will be something Hadoop-like rather than something big table, big, you know, uh, big data, uh, uh, NoSQL-like. Um, I think it will be something in that Hadoop ecosystem, but they really need to get more efficient and continue to build the next step beyond the clustered file system is to come and give a query language that skips all the rest of the Hadoop infrastructure. And so I think that's, um, that's, uh, that's the trend, at least that's the direction that, that uh, this project's gone and has had some success with, so. Thanks for sharing. Yes, thanks, definitely. Um, we would definitely love to hear more about different solutions and different implementations that you guys have out there. So find us in the break. We'll be out there and talk to us. So let me touch on, 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 on one last future thing here. We, we're all talking about OpenFlow and we're all talking SDN and how we're going to influence our routing more by ourselves. And I believe that traffic accounting data correlation is going to be one input, data input into that, making decisions about how 
we will end up influencing the traffic flow on a network. Um, I know that this is a very theoretical topic so far and there is not much going on, but have you guys seen anything around that is going into this direction and using data, flow data, anything as, as input into systems like that? Whoever. <laughs> it sounds awesome, but uh, we haven't got there yet. That's the goal. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's the same with me. Uh, I mean, I've, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, talking about it, uh, prototypes and things like that. People really are actively working on that, and also on different ideas, which is very nice. So it's. Uh, uh, it's very nice to see that SDN, ADN is a very umbrella and people are doing also different things also within this umbrella. And, uh, but yeah, not in concrete yet. It's very much uh, research and development at the moment. Let's talk about that next time. <laughs> All right, any more questions? This is it then. Thanks to all the panelists here, Paolo, Brent, Arian, and Aaron. Have a great rest of the meeting. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thanks, panelists. That was, that was wonderful. Resyncing my ear, eardrum a little bit now. We have a series of lightning talks coming up. If I can get uh, Les Peters with Newstar up here. New star in the room? Ah, here we go. <laughs>